So again, thank you, Jeremy, for your time. Our next speaker coming to the stage is I'm Scott Ford. Welcome, Scott. Hello. And so um, our speaker is the CEO at Corgabytes LLC, and Scott will be talking about um, communication um, as just something as something that is just as important as coding. And so, Scott, please feel free to share your slides when you are ready. Uh, I am share them. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Do you? We're ready for you when you are. Oh, okay. So the slides are slides are showing now. Okay. Right. Good. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, awesome. Yeah. So thanks for having me. Uh, uh, I'm Scott, um, and this is me and my business partner uh, Andrea. Uh, we went to high school together um, and became business partners uh, after reconnecting at our ten year high school reunion. And I'm very much the stereotypical software developer. Um, you know, people typically look at me and they think, okay, that's a, you know, yeah, you, you program, not a big surprise. Um, but, you know, Andrea is not your stereotypical software developer. Um, and when we first started working together, Andrea was by far the better communicator. Um, her degree and background was in business law and marketing. And we had a lot of, and she had a lot of success working as a copywriter. Um, but she dove head first into software development and really learned a ton. Um, I've been working to do the same thing about communication and really trying to learn from from Andrea. Um, but we've really both faced some harsh stereotypes, and uh, as we've kind of explored uh, this this dimension, um, you know, Andrea was once asked if she codes at the end of a meeting with a, with a potential client where she did most of the talking. Um, and this question frustrated her so much because she got asked it a lot. Um, and it would often come up at that moment when she's shaking, shaking hands with somebody that she ultimately decided to just get a tattoo on her wrist to signal that, yeah, she, you know, she knows, she knows code. She understands it. She, she gets it. Um, and, so on my end, the stereotypes that I've had to struggle with um, are kind of throughout my career, I've been told that I shouldn't be talking to customers or that I'm better with, with computers than I am with people. And this is a stereotype that, you know, makes its way into movies and in other parts of our culture. Um, <clears throat> and this idea that someone has to be put in between me and, uh, and a customer in order to uh, you know clean up the the way that I might speak otherwise, um, because it's it's determined that you know I wouldn't be good at it. So I mean that's something that I, I really started to believe, and I really started to like kind of make part of my identity is that like I wasn't really good talking to people, I wasn't good communicating. Um, so when we Andre and I first started working together, like communication is something that I outright avoided. Uh, I intentionally ignored emails, and and when I would write them, they I kept them as short as possible, and uh, try to be very very efficient with my writing, and and came off as really terse and and not very personable, um, and I often got very repeated when I found myself had, having to repeat myself. So under under really challenged me, and she challenged me in the direction of you know something that I was really proud of myself uh, about. And that's you know my ability to work with a wide variety of computer programming languages, um, and this is you know some kind sometimes called you know polyglot programming, um, and you know I really take pride in my ability to uh, to be at work in a wide variety of language ecosystems, and so she she really pushed me that you know that there's another language that I can add to my tech stack, um, and this is this is a challenge that I'd like to extend to all of you as well. And that's to add to your tech stack your team spoken language. Um, get really good and study your team spoken language in the same way uh, that you would study uh, a new programming language. Um, start to learn, you know, really pay attention to the syntax, really pay attention to how the words that you're choosing are being interpreted by, by other people in your team. Um, Pay attention to you know your your tone and your grammar and how clean your writing is and how easy it is for people to understand what your meaning was after after reading. Get curious about these things and ask people uh, about whether or not they understood what you were trying to communicate by by reading what you've written or by listening to what you had to say in the meeting. Um, 
those are all things that we get really passionate about when we're working on software systems. Um, and you know, being just as passionate about it when we're trying to communicate about those software systems is also important. Um, <clears throat> and if you aren't really sold on the idea that communication is important, um, then also consider the impact that it can have on your code base. Um, because it turns out that communication structures within our software systems like and within our organizations, they really matter. Uh, at Corgibytes, the organization uh, that Andre and I co-founded, um, we specialize in working with older neglected systems. Um, we genuinely enjoy transforming these older systems into more modern, clean systems. Um, but we've noticed over the years that poor communication is often the underlying cause for why these systems end up in this poor state to begin with. Um, and there's a popular systems law that is really kind of at the root of this. <clears throat> and it's Conway's law. And it's this observation that any organization that designs a system is going to design a system that's a mere reflection of the organization structure that that, that organization has. So this is really why we end up with legacy projects. <clears throat> it's not because the technology is bad. Um, it's that the communication within the organization is incredibly poor. Uh, and many of the organizations with this challenge, they also have another common symptom. They divide people within their organization into two arbitrary buckets. They have people who call themselves technical and they have people who call themselves non-technical. But here's the thing, when you're working on a team that's building a software system, um, no matter what department that you find yourself working in, whether it's you know software development or marketing, or um, you know social media content or customer service or testing, no matter where you find yourself within that organization, you have to have a, a fair bit of technical skill in order to do your job. So instead of it thinking of it as being this like binary, start to think about the, this recognition that you you need to have both. So the the people who have more traditional technical roles on your team, they need to know how to communicate. And the people who have, you know, what we what is often called a non-technical role, they also need to know a fair bit about tech, the technology that they're that they're working with and that, that their organization is building. Um, and so, you know, this recognition that like your ability to become technical, uh, like that's just a skill you just have to to dive in and learn. And same thing with communication, you just have to dive in and learn it. Um, and this often sh uh, you know, shows up in, in other ways with, with degree envy. Um, so there's often people in the software industry who don't come from a traditional uh, computer science background. You know, they didn't go to school to study computer science. Um, and so you know, their degree is in some other field, whether it's music or architecture or, um, or, or art or design. Uh, you know, there's a wide variety of, of people who may find themselves, you know, working in a software role. Um, but it doesn't really matter, like, what that degree was. Like, you don't have to have had a computer science degree to make yourself a good software engineer. Um, and you can also flip this around, and this is something that Andre has really, really forced me to, to think about, is that I don't need an English degree in order to be a good communicator. I don't need to, like, you know, have gone to a university program to learn how to communicate with others. Um, this is something that I, I can learn on my own. Um, and there are many people, uh, many people who do so. So, but, you know, I still find myself wondering lots of times, like, well, what is communication? And this is something that a lot of people will ask me often is like, so how, what, you know, what I consider or what we at Corgibytes consider to be communication on a project. Um, and the, at the root of understanding communication is to recognize empathy and to recognize that empathy is built uh, by listening and understanding and then trying to adopt the perspective of the person who you're listening to and, and, and understanding. Um, it's not something that you're born with. Empathy is not something that just, you know, you're granted with at birth and you either have the capacity for it or not. Uh, we all have the capacity for it. Some of us are going to, you know, have an easier time at it than others. It's a skill that you can build. Um, and, you know, by starting to pay attention to what others around you um, are saying and, and what, they, what they need in order to get their work done, 
even if that person is kind of your, the future version of yourself, um, then once you start to acquire some empathy about their position, then you can really look at ways to uh, you give them better tools to, to, to do their job and, and to make their lives easier. So we can also look at communication by kind of uh, breaking it up uh, into a synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous forms of communication are ones where, um, you know, two people are, you know, coexisting in, in the same time, maybe not necessarily the same place, but like, so if people are, are watching this live, this is a synchronous form of communication. If somebody's watching this video after the fact, watching a video of this after the fact, that's an asynchronous uh, version of, of communication. And then on software systems, we also have, you know, communication that's kind of obvious and not obvious. And the obvious versions are, you know, tend to be the ones that people think about when they think about communication on a team. You know, meetings and email and, and Slack and, and phone calls and all that sorts of stuff. Um, and then on the not obvious side, there is, uh, you know, your, your eye contact. So whether or not you're making eye contact uh, with the person who you're speaking with, you know, that's something that... Uh, that's a way of communicating. Uh, that's a communica communication tool that you can learn to develop and learn to hone. Uh, your body language, you know, how how are you gesturing and what are your gesture, gestures telling the people you're talking to about how you feel or how confident you are. Um, you can also communicate with your punctu punctuality. So you can, you know, choose to show or uh, withhold respect for someone uh, by, by being on time. So, but also in software systems, there are other asynchronous forms of communication that are, that are also worth uh, considering. So your commit messages, commit messages. Every time that you craft a commit uh, to, your, to your system, you have the opportunity to write a message that describes the intent behind why you made that change. Um, and imbuing that with, uh, with helpful context and helpful information for someone who might be curious in the future uh, is, is a way for you to communicate with people across time. Uh, naming, the names that we choose for the artifacts in our software systems, the, the names that we choose for our API endpoints, the, the names that we choose for the, the fields and the JSON objects that we pass back and forth, um, you know, those names really matter. Um, so choosing names that are arbitrary or ambiguous uh, can create a lot of confusion and may uh, result in having you know unhappy unhappy customers and unhappy uh, uh, end users of your system. And then like the, the tests that you write, uh, so whether you write automated tests or do test plans, like and if you write these down, um, you know, they end up forming a form of documentation that's kind of durable and describes the, the way your, your system works. And it's, it's a way of communicating your intent for like this is what a, the application uh, is going to do when it's working correctly. Uh, and then... <clears throat> If you're using uh, a system that has pull requests for you know, source control, um, the commentary that you provide in, in that and the communication that you that you share with people, um, you know, that really that's a that's a way of communicating with other people on your team. And your your timesheets, so like your timesheets is like a way of communicating with your with your boss. It's a way of communicating with your clients, uh, whoever might be on the receiving end of your timesheet. If it just has eight hours and like basically just says stuff. They're not going to really know necessarily what you did. If you provide a little bit more context, then that's a question that they won't have to ask you if they're kind of curious about what you were working on for a particular day. And it's one less thing that you'll have to remember if, if you could ask the question. And then error messages. And error messages um, are a great opportunity for empathy for the person who is actually like interacting with the systems that we build. So you know how, um, how rich and helpful that these error messages are, uh, the better. Uh, for the people who are using uh, the systems that we're creating. So it can be, you know, one way that you can think about communication and kind of to the definition of it is that it's it's just the artifacts of your ideas. It's just that your ideas that you have in your brain put in a more durable format that you can share with others. That's all communication is. Um, but that's not really different than code <laughs> because code is just a programmatic and executable distillation of your ideas in a, in a form that can be communicated with others. And, you know, at Coriobytes, we, all we do is legacy code. We only work with existing software systems. Um, we do a lot of upgrades. We, we add a lot of automated tests. We pay down a lot of technical debt. We, we love it. Like, we really enjoy that stuff. Um, 
And there are so many interesting engineering problems um, that are, gets, get solved within this, within this space. But most people, we find, hate working on legacy code. Um, you know, whenever, uh, well, when I gave more talks in, in person uh, with people in the room, I would ask for a show of hands and, and would often, um, you know, get, you know, maybe five to 10% of the room who said they enjoyed working on a software project that was that they inherited from somebody else. Um, and I think that the, the reason for that is that legacy code is notoriously lacking in communication. Um, and you can't be successful on a legacy project unless uh, you have some understanding of, of what the system's intent was. And Michael Feathers, when he defined uh, legacy code in his book, Working Effectively with Legacy Code, he came to a definition of legacy code as being code without tests. And you know, while that definition uh, you know, definitely worked for a lot of people, um, it's kind of problematic because it's, it's been rather polarizing. Um, you know, having 100% test coverage isn't always realistic. Um, and if you're just experimenting or building a prototype that, you know, you're just, you're just trying to experiment with things, then, you know, that's not really something we would consider to, to be legacy code. So instead, uh, at Corgibytes, and this is, you know, comes from Andrea, my business partner, we've kind of shifted that, to, shifted that to be legacy code is code without adequate communication artifacts to justify its existence, of which tests are a really good communication artifact that justify the existence uh, of a system. And you can often think about this as like an archeological project. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the tests uh, that, that somebody leaves behind on a system, you can think of those as like bones, they tell you a lot, but you also have lots of other resources and other pieces of information that you can draw from on an archeological dig, like you know, pottery, coins, buildings, writings, tons and tons of artifacts that you can use to get an understanding of the civilization that occupied this space. And communication on software projects uh, is very much the same. So, okay, all right. So why does this matter? Why, why is communication you know, worth you know, spending this much time thinking about within, within the context of a software system? Well, one, like if you wanna level up in your career, if you wanna kind of move to the next level, uh, you know, whatever your career path is, if, if you eventually want to become a manager or move up to be a CTO one day or even a, a CEO, um, knowing how to communicate is, is, is really important uh, for that. Uh, communication is also going to help you build trust with others. It, it's going to help you, um, you know, make commitments uh, to other people and then honor them. Uh, and each one of those is almost like a little marble that you place in that person's trust jar, which is a, a metaphor from Brene Brown's work. And then good communication can really help you avoid, uh, you know, having to put out fires on your team. So, you know, there are many people who feel like their, their, their day to day at work is just going or going around and putting out fires that have come up. But communicating really well and communicating proactively can be a way to help prevent these fires from starting in the first place. Um, so I'm going to go through some really quick patterns and frameworks uh, that that we've developed at Corgi Bytes uh, to help us uh, to help us implement you know different different forms of communication because you know looking at communication in terms of patterns and frameworks that's something we're already really used to doing within the software context. So context switching is something that uh, I struggle with a lot. It's something that uh, anytime uh, somebody asks, hey, you got a second, I just, I get really frustrated. Uh, I just want to flip the table. Um, so at Corgibytes, we came up with this uh, metaphor of uh, having like a dream within a dream where of like all these ideas that I've got built in my head while I'm working on a problem, um, it's almost like I'm like several dreams in. Uh, and if somebody just asks me, hey, do you got a second? Even the mental energy that it takes to adequately answer that question, I end up watching all of this like mental palace that I've built evaporate. But if instead I get asked, what's my inception level? Which is more of a question of like, how far down am I? How, how deep into the problem uh, am I right now? Um, then that's a lot easier for me to assess. And I can just say, um, you know, like, well, this is a five. And, and, and so the person could say, oh, okay. Uh, I'll check in with you later uh, when you're closer to zero um, or ping me when you get closer to zero. So that can be a great way to figure out like whether or not it's safe to interrupt someone. Um, and this is kind of the, you know, the, the, the scale that, that we'd like to use for that. Another uh, comes from uh, the show, How I Met Your Mother. Um, there's a character in there, Ted, and anytime he says, 
Well, actually, they like shatter some shatter some glass just to point out how often he does it. Um, and this is something that I've noticed engineers do a lot in their career. Uh, software developers are, are uh, have a tendency to be very much well actually people, uh, and instead uh, trying to really embrace uh, you know Tina Fey's work uh, from the book Bossy Pants and um, the uh, the improvisation techniques, and specifically around yes and. Uh, so in improvisation games, you wouldn't well actually someone you would like try to build on what they've said and, and keep going. Uh, also giving feedback without being mean. So this is a framework that comes from, uh, you know, radical, this is from Radical Candor developed by Kim Scott. Um, and it's basically all about developing a, a way to, you know, communicate that you care about somebody, but also challenge their behavior directly and give them, you know, direct feedback. Uh, and Kim, Kim Scott has some really great resources uh, and, and books for how you can dive in and, and get smarter about that. But if you don't walk away with anything else from this presentation, I want you to walk away with communication is a skill that you can that you can gain. You know, you can learn it, and I believe in you. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> you can do it too. Um, here's a, a a quick uh, peek at some of the resources that went into uh, creating this talk, and other resources that that you can dive into if you're curious. Uh, and here's how to get in touch with me. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much for that, Scott. That was wonderful. You know, I think I'd like to preface by saying that, you know, I, I, people really sometimes underestimate the power of communication and collaboration, especially in 21st century spaces. And so I really appreciate, you know, your, your insight, um, but also just the recognition that these are skills that can indeed be cultivated, right? You don't have to be born with them to, to learn them um, over time. And so that's, that's something that I think is really important. So just uh, for the first question for you is really just about, you know, a mindset and a culture shift. So I'd love for you to just take, you know, some time to talk about the kind of culture or mindset shift that really has to happen within organizations in order to embrace some of the frameworks that you've just discussed. Yeah, I think so for me, the big mental shift was the recognition that the words I use to talk about the things that I'm building are just as important as the things I'm building. That's it's really kind of like the, that's the title of this talk. Communication is just as important as code. Um, that's something that we really made one of our core values at Corgi Bytes is, you know, we want to make sure that we put as much passion and as much attention and intention into the communication we create as we would the software systems that we create. Um, and I think, you know, kind of recognizing that one isn't necessarily more important than the other. Because uh, I've certainly worked at organizations in the past before where it was like the way things were talked about was way more important than how they were built. I've seen the pendulum swing too far the other direction. You really have to you know, find that good balance when you're working on, on a team that's, that's building a software system. Wonderful. And my next question for you is, you know, what communication artifacts do you feel are the most important to help teams who are working on a legacy, on a legacy project or legacy system? Yeah, I think I think any communication artifacts that are in and of themselves executable. So the, the best for, forms of documentation for a software system are are forms that you know are themselves basically programs. Um, you know, this can be uh, if you're using Cucumber, so it could be like in the form of a Gherkin-based test suite. It could be uh, you know a Docker file that you know in an executable fashion documents how to set up a uh, production and or development environment for, for your application. Um, those are ways of documenting, you know, how things are done on, on your, on your team uh, in a very executable way. Uh, so those are, you know, finding ways to document, uh, you know, your system and documenting your intention in ways that are executable, I think are always the best. Thank you so much for your time and for your wonderful presentation today, Scott. I think we all learned a lot from you. Um, and so before you leave, I'd love, love to give you a chance to just let folks know how they can contact you, um, how they can learn more about your work, et cetera. Um, if you could please share that with us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, my, my slide, if you, if you could share my slides again, I've got a slide up with, uh, with my Twitter handle uh, and uh, for, both, uh, for both myself and for my business uh, company's website, uh, careerbytes.com. Um, and then also uh, community uh, and podcast that, that we've built, legacyco.rocks. 
Um, and also, you feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'd be happy to chat with anybody there. Thank you. Thank you, and have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thanks. You too.